Happy Thursday, kittens! It is, oh goodness, it is October 5th, 2017, and this is not a podcast episode 188. Welcome, and thank you so much for joining me today, both new and review, reviewing, returning viewers. Oh my goodness, guys, it's been like five weeks since I've recorded. I'm sorry, I am so rusty. <laughs> if this is your first time here, thank you for checking out my podcast, and if you continue to return... I appreciate it. Thank you, even though I am often a hot mess. Why did you suddenly come here? You never bother me. You know I'm talking to the camera. We have a dog. <laughs> ah, so anyway, I am your host, Amanda. You can find me as Wit on Ravelry or as Sonipi on Instagram and on YouTube. Show notes for this episode and all Not A Podcast episodes are on the blog at sonitpicky.net. And you can find the Ravelry group under Not K-N-O-T, a podcast. I am also the dyer for Lammy Toes, which is lammytoeshop.etsy.com. And before I go into today's show, I thought I would just give a little note that if you are in the local area, meaning upstate, far upstate New York, you know, like upstate, upstate New York, um, I am doing a small vending event on this Saturday, October 7th, in Sackett's Harbor at a shop called Stitches and Picks, which is on Main Street. And I guess there's also a quilt show or something going on in town there. I'm not exactly sure, uh, but I will be doing a small vend from 10.30, I think, until 4 in the afternoon, or unless I run out of yarn. I don't see that happening, but uh, at that shop. So if you happen to be in the area, stop in and say hi. Let me know that you found out about it through the podcast. So I think that's it for administration, guys. Um, let me see. It has been a very long time since I recorded. I did not intend to be gone quite this long. I thought I was going to be recording my next episode sometime around the 25th-ish of September. Uh, that has not happened, uh, largely because I have not had a lot of content to show. That's been kind of the theme, I think, for the last six months has been, sorry, I do not have any content, but um, that's just how things have gone. Right after I last recorded, like within two days, my knitting mojo up and left me. Like it just went right out the door into the ether and it hasn't come back yet. So I am tentatively calling this episode Stitching September because I've been doing a lot of things in September that were not knitting, although that could also be considered stitching, but these are more of the cross stitch variety and a little bit of sewing. So let's get on into the episode today. Um, for knitting, I have no finished objects. I have one work in progress to show you and one I have a story to tell about it. And then I have a bunch of cross stitch, a little bit of sewing, and then there might be a discussion topic at the end about what happens when your knitting mojo leaves you. So let's get on into things. Uh, like I said, no finished objects, which probably is surprising considering the last time I talked to you guys, I had a bunch of progress done on a pair of children's socks for my son. So this is our story, you guys. <sighs> so I kept trying them on my hand and stretching them out and they felt like they were a really good size. Like they, they stretched nice and big. They could, it felt like they could almost fit onto my foot, but they were too tight. And that would make sense because his foot is about an inch and a half smaller than mine. Um, I did not check my gauge on these because I very rarely check my gauge on socks and that was a mistake. Um, by the time I got done knitting both tubes and I thought they were okay, I cut out the heels to do true afterthought heels and upon trying them on my son, he couldn't get them up past his instep. <sighs> yeah, they, they were a fail. So I ended up checking the gauge and checking my math and realizing they were approximately three quarters of an inch too small around in circumference to be a proper sock. So I thought, okay, my son's not going to get these as socks, but my daughter could wear them because her feet are quite a bit thinner than my son's. And I, sorry, I have neighbors walking by and my windows are open. They can probably hear me. Oh, why do they always stand right in front of my house? <laughs> can you hear them? <laughs> okay. So anyway, now that they're passing, cause like my window is like right on the street here and everyone walks right by it. And I don't know, I feel very self-conscious. So anyway, as I was saying, um, I thought they would fit my daughter's feet because her feet are quite a bit thinner than my son's, as are her legs. So I thought, oh, okay, well, they don't fit him, but they can fit her. They'll be a little long, but that just means she'll wear them longer. 
couldn't get them up over her instep either. I'm not sure what exactly happened. I don't know if I should have knit in some more rounds on the heel. I just, I don't know. But I got very angry and because they were already cut into, I decided I didn't want to try to salvage the yarn. I threw them in the trash. I know somebody out there is very upset with me. I'm sorry. I just threw them in the trash and then my knitting mojo left me. <laughs> um, I have actually um, worked on something else. I'm going to put in a video here. And since I last talked to you guys, I did manage to finish the third square on my 10 stitch blanket, the really scrappy one I've been doing. And I think I took a minute and a half long video or so, maybe two minute video. So I'm going to put it in right here and then I will talk to you when it's done. Okay guys, I apologize for the really cruddy lighting here, but this is my dining table and there's no natural light here. So I thought I would try to show you guys. I'm gonna move you just a little bit here. Sorry, that's my dog complaining in the background. Um, I thought I would try to show you guys all three squares at the same time on this surface because they are about 18 and a half inches square each. They are large and these are the three so far. So. This one was the first one that you guys have seen before. Then we have number two, which I finished, I think, just before August. I think I finished this at the end of July, beginning of August. And now we've got number three, which I've been working on since, uh, I think I started it just before September, but I didn't count my first couple rounds in my August numbers. I counted them in my September numbers. But yeah, so now I've got these. And I think so far, they're a really interesting mix of colors. Um, I've got some more solid yarns coming in so that I'm in a position to be able to mix in some more solids so that it's a little bit more rainbowy rather than just teals and little bits of purple and gold and those mushroomy colors I like so much because uh, that's all I really have in stash. So now that you guys have seen that, and just go over these again real quick. I'm going to put a sashing in between that's a light, or not a light, but a darker color kind of like this. It'll be something similar to this, but maybe just a little bit more brown. And it's going to go in between all of them, and I think it's going to look amazing. So I'm not sure if I'm going to do six more of these and make this a square blanket, or if I'm going to do 12 more and make this a rectangular blanket. So that is my blanket project. Something else I realized I wanted to say and I'm going to interject here. It's really interesting to see the progression of these blocks. Uh, numbers one and two are a little wonky because I think there's a little bit more variation in the thickness of the yarn. But I noticed here that in block number one, if you look really closely at these seams, you can see they kind of jut around a little bit. I was not very good at figuring out exactly where to turn the corners on this first block. But by the second block, you can see I totally figured that out and they're all nice and straight and they all line up. But I was still having problems figuring out where to end this square. By the third one, I figured out where to end it. It looks a little wonky at the moment because it's not blocked, but it's perfectly even with the ends. All of my little seams <laughs> line up. And uh, actually this blanket, despite the fact that there is some variation in the thicknesses of the yarn, this square, it lays flat on its own, whereas the other two, um, you might be able to see are trying to buckle and pucker in the middle. The middle section seems really tight. Come see, it doesn't want to lay down flat at all um, compared to the rest of it. So I thought it was interesting, and I thought you might want to see that progression real quick. And also that way, too, if you uh, feel bad ever about your own projects and think, oh my gosh, this first part looks horrible, I can't do this, you know, just keep trying. Uh, a lot of things are trial and error, and if one doesn't look perfect or amazing it'll be fine like you can also see here too really well right here that my pickups at first were terrible I could not figure out how to pick these up in a consistent manner they're just awful and then by like the outside of this one here you can see I figured it out but like on all the other ones here I have it it's all nice and neat it's always the same one each time and they look fantastic so if you're having problems please do not give up and keep trying because the more you try hopefully 
you will figure out a proper technique. Okay, so you guys can see what the first three squares look like, and I'm pretty happy with them, and I, I think I talked about, it's been so long since I've recorded this video, you guys, it's been like a month. Um, I talked about, I think, you know, different things that I like about the pattern, and discussed how, you know, it's good to persist and keep practicing something, even if it's not looking great at first, because you do get better. So I am now on the fourth square of this blanket. This is the only knitting I have done in the last five weeks because I haven't had any desire to do anything else. I haven't started any sweaters. Um, there's definitely not gonna be a Rhinebeck sweater. I'm actually not even sure if I'm going to Rhinebeck at this point. Maybe I'll talk about my life stuff at the end because a lot of my, I think a lot of the reason why I don't have Knitting Mojo right now is I'm just under a lot of stress and I'll talk about that. So anyway, fourth square. So I have made really good progress and I'm almost done with this square. Um, I have done, as you can see, the center. This one is very hollow, like pastel Halloween in my opinion. Center square, first self striping. Uh, the center square is some Spud and Chloe fine that Christina sent me. Um, I know you're probably watching Christina so thank you. I have been using your yarns. Uh, this one is from Ladybug Fiber Company and it's um, the Mesa? desert something I cannot remember but it's a beautiful self striping colorway in these really soft grays and like this candy orange and this lavender um, some more knit picks capretta which I think I used on the last square um, some opal sock wool um, it was the special effects makeup colorways uh, this one I did a pair of socks out of it's like grays and purples and oranges and pinks I kind of like those uh, then I got some Knit Picks Stroll Tweed. I bought some more um, solid colors since the last time I talked to you guys because I realized my blanket did not have a lot of variety in terms of the solids I was going to use. And I realized I was going to need a little bit more, so I brought in a couple more colors so that there's a little bit of variation. So I did that. And you can kind of see there, really pretty, subtly um, tweedy. So it's it presents as a solid. And right now I'm adding the next self-striping, which is some leftover query fiber arts from a pair of socks I did a couple years ago. And it's this really muted rainbow. Um, and I've got a good chunk of it left, so you guys can kind of see here. Um, when I bought it, I wasn't happy with the yarn because it wasn't the same colorway it looked like on her Etsy shop, uh, but I used it anyway, and I'm liking it for this purposes because it's, it's got a very fall kind of autumnal vibe to it. So you can see it's already a good size. I think all I have left is this round and then the solid color round, and then I think the square is done. So I'm hoping to have it done definitely by the end of this month. Sorry guys, that was a neighbor girl. Um, so as I was saying, I, um, I think it's just got those two color stripes left. And those two rounds left and then I think it's gonna be the full finished size already um, I'm not um, having any hard deadlines on this blanket but I would like to finish a square approximately once every four to six weeks and I think I'm going to need only nine of them to get a really good sized blanket and this is number four so by the time I finish this I'm going to be almost halfway through the blanket already by the time I finish number five I'll be just over halfway done with the square portion of the blanket knitting and that's all I've knit. Um, I am hoping to very soon cast on a sweater. I'm hoping to re-pick up my brioche a luscious shawl. I still want to go shh, 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 shh when I'm saying that because it gets stuck in my mouth. Um, I'm hoping to finish that maybe by the end of the year. I'm also hoping to maybe cast on some hand spun socks or something else for myself because, um, I don't know, I, I do miss knitting. It's just for whatever reason... Um, I have very negative feelings about it, so I haven't been working on it. So let's move on to a lot of cross-stitch content. <laughs> so for those of you who have been with me for a while, but not the whole time, and you've heard me or you see in my description that I do other crafts too, and you thought, well, that's not true. I've only ever seen you really talk about knitting, Amanda, and sometimes spinning. The truth is I actually work on a lot of different types of crafts, and cross-stitch is one that I have not worked on really much at all in the last 18 months so it's been a while since it's been on the podcast and today there's going to be a lot of it so let's talk about that. Um, first I'm going to be putting in another video because it was a finished project and it's the first one I did and it is a gift that I did for a friend. Um, I think all the information is in the video but in case I don't say it it is from Stitch Bucket Patterns on Etsy and it is the Never Tell Me the Odds pattern. Okay guys, so I thought I would take a minute to film some video of another finished object you are not going to get to see in my stitching section today. 
uh, by the time you guys uh, see this recording, it will be long gone to a new home. I made this as a gift for a friend of mine who happens to very much love Star Wars and Han Solo in particular. Uh, this is, I think the pattern is called Never Tell Me the Odds. It's another stitch bucket pattern. And I discussed stitch bucket on the last episode of the podcast where I did the Stranger Things cross stitch. I think that was two episodes ago. Um, so overall, it's super cute as you guys can see. That is a four inch finished frame. Um, it is on 32 count even weave, which is my favorite thing to stitch on. And these are all Cosmo flosses that I converted myself from the DMC flosses given on the pattern. For a few of these, the known equivalents between the two, between DMC and Cosmo, were way, way off. So I had to go through my, um, my bucket of flosses to do things a little differently. Sorry, I'm trying to stand still here, but I don't think I'm doing such a good job. I'm trying not to make any of you guys seasick or motion sick. Um, if I could do this a little differently, I would have done uh, the gray green is a little bit too green in my opinion. I think the blue could have been a blacker blue on the pants. Mostly it's all stuff on Han that I'm not the happiest with. I also would have done his main skin tone just a touch darker because I think that there's a little bit too much contrast between the dark and the light. Um, and I did do some floss switches on Chewy here because some of the flosses as written and also the highlights for Han's hair were super mustardy yellow instead of golden brown, which is what they were supposed to be. So again, I did some quick uh, switch outs. You can find conversion charts between the two flosses online in several places, um, but sometimes you just have to use your common sense and figure out what color is best. So uh, yeah, that is it. It was a super easy cross stitch. It took me about two evenings of stitching. Like I said, it's a teeny tiny frame here. You guys know, like you can see my hand here. And I have small child size hands. Let's switch here because there you go, that hand's steadier. Ch small child size hands. This is a four inch hoop. Super small, super cute. I'm hoping she enjoys it. And uh, I did a better job finishing this one. I figured out my technique a little bit better after the last um, cross stitch I showed you guys. This time I was a little smarter and I took the same fabric and I uh, put it in between the hoops here like I put everything in the hoop at the same time. Last time I didn't realize you had to do that and I put the fabric in and then tried to keep it pressed down and curled up on the edge at the same time. I fixed that this time and then with the pinking shears I went around and cut it basically even with the hoop. And then I cut all of the fabric about, I don't know, a half an inch, three between half and three quarters of an inch off. And then I took some uh, E600 epoxy, I think, and I put it all the way around, pressed down the frame. I used a, a wood stick to not touch it. This is one of those sticks that comes in bags of stuffing sometimes, or fiber fill stuffing for uh, toys and things. And I pressed it down as best I could. And then I took some Clover Wonder Clips and I gently clipped it all down to hold until the epoxy dried. And as you can see, I didn't do the best job getting it super even, but it worked well enough. Um, it's the back of a cross stitch. I'm not too worried about neatness on that. Um, if I wanted to be a bit of a stickler, I could then go around and like glue in some some trim or something, but I'm not super worried about how the back looks because it's the back. So there you guys go. That is one thing that I finished since I last recorded. Uh, so there is that one. I also worked on another pattern by the same designer. Um, I don't know where it went. I just went looking for it while we were on the break here. And uh, I did one that I finished and I'm going to do as a set of three, but I think I'll talk about it later or... Um, yeah, it's there's so much content. I don't need to talk about it right now. Maybe when I finish the the trio, maybe I'll show that one off. The next one I worked on was from Fox. You are so crafty on Etsy. Uh, she is an Australian designer, I think, of cross stitches, and I did the Ola Llama pattern. Now, when I looked for this the other day, I didn't see it. I think she's discontinued this one, and I think that she's replaced it with an alpaca pattern that's very similar. But this one has been finished and hanging on my wall for a while. Um, I ended up changing out a bunch of the colors. I just randomly um, mixed them in as I saw fit. I didn't see if I had the ones that the pattern actually calls for. So like I did the llamas and darker colors and things than is recommended. But this is just a little one. I think this is a five inch hoop. And you can see it's just, it's a very sweet little cross stitch. It's two 
little matching llamas, a taller llama and a slightly shorter llama. Uh, they're out and there's a sun and clouds and a couple of cacti. And then they're each in a poncho and a little tiny hat, which I find kind of amusing. And then for these colors, you can't see them as well. I used a pale gold, uh, a very pale minty blue and a very pale pink. And then I did a different order on this one. And I really like how it came out. Um, it is now hanging on that big wall in my kitchen on the other side of this wall um, where I have been um, collecting and putting up a bunch of art and things. Uh, I then finished it off messily, but I'm getting a little better by uh, putting fabric, some more of this tulip pink fabric. This time I pinched it in between the two hoops. I figured out that that's the smarter way to do it, trimmed it short. And then uh, did not have quite enough fabric around the cross stitch. I tend to be a little bit overly frugal with my fabric. Um, I don't like to cut off a lot of excess. So I tend to try to figure out what's the smallest amount I could possibly get away with using. And if I'm going to put them in a hoop like this, that doesn't really work. So I have to keep that in mind for future pod or future podcast future projects um, and then I took some e6000 epoxy and I pushed down what I could cut off edges so it's it's messy on the back but it's it's very cute on the front um, I did consider maybe painting the frame and I'm not going to I obviously didn't for this one but with future ones I might actually paint the frames a little bit I did buy a lot of hoops in bulk off of Amazon so that uh, in the future I have them for easy framing because I really actually kind of like being able to get my stuff framed when possible. And I do have some other small ones I would like to work on. So the last thing I've been working on, and if you're friends with me on Instagram, you've been seeing this now for about two weeks, I am working on a free pattern by uh, designer Kyoko Maruoka. Uh, she designs under the name Jera or Gera. I'm not sure if it's a hard G or a soft G. I haven't taken conversational Japanese in a very long time. It's G-E-R-A exclamation point and she has a ton of gorgeous patterns. Like <laughs> could be my new obsession with stuff I want to stitch patterns. Some of them are very cute and very modern. She does tons of fairy tale related ones and she has an absolutely gorgeous series that involves Russian fairy tales, particularly the Firebird. And um, there's a few others in the series that I really, really love. They're just, they're gorgeous. Sorry. I now have a neighbor with their loose dog outside the window and now my dogs are yelling. Okay, he has finally retrieved his dog. I'm probably gonna cut most of that out, but if you guys, if I don't, I may have just made you watch like a minute and a half of my dogs yelling and losing their minds while someone's retrieving their own dog. God, that small dog, you guys. Okay, so as I was saying, this is a free pattern. I, I will leave the download or the link to the download in the show notes. And uh, if you want to get the exact colors and the exact linen, Pink Castle Fabrics sells, I think, an Ida cloth and a linen cross stitch kit for this. Um, with the Cosmo flosses, if you would like to try out Cosmo flosses and not have to go hunting them down, I own a lot of Cosmo flosses, so I just had to buy a few that I didn't already have. Um, but I have made a pretty good amount of progress, and this is called the Mushroom Family Sampler. And so far, it's going pretty well. Uh, as you can see, this is linen, so you can see through it. I like to use even weave normally, but I liked the color of the background on this so much that I actually bought the uh, recommended linen and the brand and the color. Um, and it is a, an alphabet sampler with lots of little greenery and all these different really, really um, character filled mushrooms. I love these mushrooms so much you guys. These are the best. I'm currently stitching this one which is a granny mushroom and she'll have little spectacles on. There's this one that looks kind of like a flower. This one that reminds me a little bit of like broccoli. This trio down here is so cute. This one might be one of my favorite ones. It looks like it's wearing a little tutu. There's grandpa mushroom and there's going to be like a, um, I'm working my way down. So I started off in the middle and I filled in all the middle that I could with where I started and then I went up and I'm working my way uh, counterclockwise back around. So I'm heading this way and then I'm gonna fill back up and then come here and finish. 
and I think so far it's working pretty well. Um, I am starting to lose some steam. I'm sorry. It, this is going to be like the noisiest podcast ever because apparently all my neighbors are jerks. I'm sorry. <laughs> it is so hard to have dogs sometimes because they um, they get so easily distracted and they're so vocal all the time. So I'm starting to lose my cross stitch mojo, which makes me a little bit sad. Um, I was hoping it might last a little bit longer and I might be able to get another month out of it because I'm really hoping it's not going to be 18 months again before I decide that I want to work on cross stitching again because I do have four samplers from the Frosted Pumpkin Stitchery that are hibernating in a drawer and I have a bunch more patterns that I would like to stitch up from a bunch of different designers. Just a moment. Yeah, I think the subtitle for this episode is going to be Dogs are Jerks Sometimes, Jerk Faces. <laughs> okay, so as I was saying, I'm hoping that my cross stitch mojo will hold out a little bit longer. I see I'm losing my light again here. I'm so sorry, guys. I didn't end up doing this until later in the day. I was hoping to record a little earlier when it was sunnier, and now the sun's going down. <laughs> but, uh, so I'm hoping to get this one done. Um, I would like to do one of my smaller Frosted Pumpkin Stitchery ones. I still have the one with the turkey and the give thanks, I think it says on it, the Thanksgiving one. I think that one would be a really fun quick stitching project. I still am kind of feeling a lot of Halloween cross stitches, but I don't think I'm going to get to them before Halloween this year. So I think I'm going to have to make that um, a project for 2018 maybe to try and stitch up all of my um, Halloween ones and then add some more. I'm going to adjust the camera here for just a second. I'm sorry. We're vibrating and tilting, which is kind of weird. <laughs> We're on my desk, and my desk is not very stable. It's one from the container store, the Elba or whatever their line is that they carry. There's another loose dog out there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and anyway, uh, the desk sits on top of the legs and is held in place with like a really heavy duty Velcro. So the desk wobbles really easily. Basically, once we move from this duty station, I want to get a proper desk, but I figure for now it's doing what it needs to do. But it's not the most sturdy or stable. It does its job just fine, but if you move even just a little bit, it, it shakes. So anyway, um, I'm hoping between now and the end of the year that I might be able to take out one of the four works in progress samplers I have and maybe work on a couple of months from one of those or something. I would like to try to get another one of those finished up. That took forever with a lot of distractions. I apologize. Okay, so that was cross stitching. And then I did, as I said, a little bit of sewing. And I have been working on uh, Sonia, Sonia, Sonia Phillips patterns. Uh, they are called, well, she does the design house 100 acts of sewing. But this is just not working today, you guys. There are so many people out there. Because it, it's a beautiful day. It's only 70 degrees right now and it's stayed unnaturally uh, hot. <laughs> this time of year. Anyway, Sonia is 100 acts of sewing. I'm going to try to gently take out one of my patterns over here. This is a different pattern. This is dress number one, but I've been making shirt number one. Interruption number a billindy. It was another child. <laughs> oh my goodness. So anyway, I was saying about Sonia Phillips, uh, 100 acts of sewing. Her shirt number one pattern, if you are subscribed to Creative Bug, she has a really fun, nice class on there about her shirt number one and a bunch of different ways you can alter the shirt. And I did happen to take the class, so I have actually, I've actually taken this and I really, really enjoyed it. And I love being able to see in very clear, concise videos, um, steps of how to do things. I'm not a novice sewer, sewist, but I'm not super confident in my skills either. Um, I don't, tend to be the most accurate. Um, I I don't know. I just, even though I've gotten better and more patient over time, I still don't have quite the level of precision needed to be a really, really good sewist. And so I wanted simple clothing patterns because I'm just to this point where I really do want to make more, more of my own clothing. And I've decided that I don't really want fussy clothing either. I don't really care if I'm wearing something that looks more like a sack and is more in the style of the super simple, super big, not flattering kind of Japanese um, house dresses and things that you see. So I ended up sewing two shirts number two about 10 days ago, a week ago. And the first one I did, I did with a contrast uh, upper, which is one of the 
modifications she shows you. Uh, you can see my bias tape here. I used a Japanese print that I have. I had a lot of fun actually making bias tape even though it's kind of putsy. And then I used a little bit of peach double gauze from Cotton and Steel. And then I used a little bit of this uh, Nanny Eero brushed twill I have. If I were to do this again, I would have probably have done the twill on the top and the gauze on the bottom because these aren't exactly, I'm trying to get this, <laughs> Wait, that's the, that color is much better. Um, they're not exactly um, compatible with each other. Uh, double gauze is much, much lighter weight, much more airy than the brushed twill is. The brushed twill feels almost like a flannel. I really enjoyed working with it though, but whenever I purchased it, I bought only a yard of it. I don't know what I thought I was going to make with a yard of this, as obviously I am not sized in any way that I'm ever going to get a yard out of anything, or a project out of one yard. So I did that first, and the only modification I made the first time is I chose to grade out the hips on the bottom to the 4x size. I made the 2x size. Um, and then I ended up, when I was sewing it, I did it on my serger and I used quarter inch seams instead of the half inch because especially in the sleeves, I realized I wasn't going to have enough ease. I'm going to set this off to the side here. Um, so I finished it and it fits, but like I thought, the sleeves do not have enough ease. I think they only have like a half an inch or three quarters of an inch positive ease in them. It's just enough that it feels a little restrictive and tight, like you can't really move your arms. But it does fit and it is cute. So I'm hoping that um, eventually, <laughs> as my grief bacon hopefully decides to let go at some point, that I will go back down to a little slightly smaller size and it'll get just enough ease in the arms to be able to wear it more comfortably. Otherwise, I did learn a lot from it and I'm very happy with it and it's cute as all else. So for the second one, I ended up altering my pattern piece and I did a, a, a single color on this one. I altered it to have size 2x across the bust, 4x, 4x in the hips and 4x in the arms to give my arms like two inches of positive ease all the way around which um, other sources I had read stated that for like a woven fabric you really don't want to have less than an inch and a half of positive ease or else you start to get that very restrictive tight across the back feeling in your sleeves. So this one I did another double gauze. I happen to have a lot of double gauze. I like it. And it's this, you guys have seen this on the podcast before, forever ago. It's these really fun cats in glasses and bow ties. And uh, on this one, I used a little bit of this. I think this is a, this might be a Pat Bravo print. Um, I turned that into some bias tape. Um, as you can see, my sewing is not the greatest. On both of these tops, I had a little problem with the, um, the double gauze folding on itself a little bit, tiny little pin tucks. But this time... It fits properly. Um, I didn't cut the neckline quite as low on this one and I wish that I had because the neckline is a touch high but everything else fits pretty well. Um, it's got a little bit too much excess fabric underneath the arms in that kind of um, that armpit area but I would rather have it be slightly too big as I do plan to layer these over dresses and things in the future. So I am pretty happy with that. Um, and I have not tried any further attempts on the pattern since then, um, but I'm hoping to maybe make a skirt or a dress here between now and Saturday because I kind of have this vision of going to this event in a cute little handmade outfit and all this stuff. So that's been it for sewing, which for me, that's the most sewing I've done in a long time. Um, I was pretty, I've been pretty happy with the results and it got a little bit of a, a large stack of fabric gone. So there's just little bits and pieces left over now and I'm going to either use some more of that cats for another contrast yoke on another shirt or maybe a detail on something else or I might make it some bags out of it if I ever get to sewing bags again. And uh, yeah, I think that's it for crafting content, you guys. Um, if you do not want to hang around to hear about life stuff or um, my musings about when uh, Knitting Mojo goes away, uh, thank you for joining me and I will talk to you hopefully in about a month. If not, let's go into the life portion. I'm going to get a drink of water here. which is in this uh, Dunkin' Donut version of the You Are Here mugs. There's my little badger. Because I am a Wisconsin girl. And you can see it in my art too. I have um, art that a very sweet friend of mine 
painted for me that she does and she occasionally sends me paintings and so I frame them and I put them up. So what's been going on? Life stuff. Um, It's been, oh gosh, so long. Five weeks. What's happened in five weeks? What hasn't happened in five weeks? So things have been really busy here. Um, my husband is currently doing a really, really long exercise, which is making things a little stressful at the moment. But our house situation has not remedied itself yet. The house has been finished and on the market for like two months now and has not gotten a renter, which is unusual for that house. In the past, it's never sat on the rental market more than two or three days without getting snatched up and getting a renter in it right away. And we started to get a little suspicious about what's going on and why it's not renting. The house is in Central Texas, so obviously we can't just go and peek on it and see what's going on. So I'm lucky to have a friend who still lives in the area and I, um, I texted her about it and just said, hey, I hate to ask you a favor, but can you go to this rental company and pose as a renter and get the keys to the house and can you please tell me honestly what is going on in there? Uh, she sent me a bunch of pictures and it turns out that it was still very dirty. Um, the workers had not fully finished putting everything back together. The yard was a mess. Nobody had trimmed up anything. Um, the whole house is just, it's very overgrown and it's very dirty. It looks kind of like we're slumlords. And it looks like it could potentially be a murder house. And that was not helped by the fact that the rental company does not like to put on lights, apparently. They turn off the electric when no one's in the house. And uh, that house, especially the center of it with the, um, the kitchen and the dining areas and things, no natural light reaches it. So you get in there and it is pitch black. And that house, when it's dark and cold, I'm going to tell you guys, it's kind of creepy in there. I remember that from when we were in there, when we were fixing it up, that when it was quiet and it was dark and it was kind of chilly, it was just, it, it's a, it can be a very creepy house. So <laughs> it became immediately apparent exactly what was going on. And uh, I had to get a little rude with the rental company the other day and tell them, I sent them the photos and I just said, would you be happy if this was the state of your house? And if not, why have you done this and let this happen to mine? Um, the best I can determine is that um, nobody actually checked on the work the contractors did. They just assumed it was done and they let them go. Uh, they've all apparently been recalled like it was it was little things but they add up like the closet doors had been taken off when the carpet guys came in to put in the new carpet if you don't know what happened if you go back a couple of months back into like Mayish time um, I talk about this in an episode where I'm up against my kitchen wall so it looks kind of like this one um, and talk about the hoarding saga in my house so <laughs> Anyway, they did not do things like put the doors back on. Um, they didn't, the cleaning person didn't fully finish cleaning. They had been recalled at least once to finish up the job and they still didn't finish it. And because it had been two months, no one had been back in to check. So like the toilets were filthy and disgusting. There were dead bugs all over the place in there. It just, it, not the kind of place that people want to rent and with how long it had been on the market I'm amazed that they did not send anybody over there to check on the house and be like wow what is going on here like there was garbage and detritus all in the backyard and I'm just sitting there going well no wonder it's not renting because why would anyone want to rent that house especially if you can't even see it and it seems kind of creepy and dark and there's bugs and there's all this stuff going on in there um it was stuff like a spider and like there's those trumpets and like one dead, well, they're telling me it's a water bug, but I think it's a cockroach because those two can be kind of interchangeable, but it's central Texas and it's very humid and it's very warm. And no matter what you do, they're going to come in. So you make sure to spray regularly. So anyway, that has been very stressful because the house we had assumed was going to be rented right away because one of the work crew said that they wanted to rent it and then they never did. Um, so that's been happening and because of that unfortunately I'm like 90% sure I'm canceling my plans to go to Rhinebeck this month because that was kind of contingent on having a renter and being able to find the money to do that and instead I have for now six months been making out-of-pocket mortgage payments on the house which while I'm glad we can make those payments they eat up basically every single cent of extra money that comes out of the paycheck right now 
So I have like two or three more days to decide whether or not I'm going to cancel my reservation, but I just don't, I can't in good conscience go to Rhinebeck and create a little bit of extra debt to be able to go and do that. Um, we know we're going to be here an extra year now, so I do still have next fall to attend Rhinebeck hopefully. Um, but yeah, I don't think this year is in the cards and that's really disappointing because as of last week I was confirming with people that I was planning to be there. So I apologize guys, I'm probably not going to be there um, and I will know more in the next three to four days. <sighs> well, so that's a bummer. So let's talk about the discussion topic instead. So leading up into this, um, I had written down that I thought I would talk about what you do when your knitting mojo abandons you. Um, those of us who are hardcore knitters like capital K knitters, um, every so often your mojo just the desire to knit leaves. And there are lots of reasons this can happen. A major life event may have happened. You may have lost a job, lost a loved one. Some other really big stress happens. Um, maybe you have a project that really upsets you and you just don't feel like working on it. Um, I had a combination of I think the stress and the project kind of did me in. Um, and sometimes it's only a few days of not wanting to knit. Sometimes it's weeks. Um, in my case, it's been over a month, and I know for some people it lasts a few months, um, and you just don't feel like knitting. And for whatever reason, maybe the knitting causes more stress than it's worth, maybe it reminds you of something negative. Um, for whatever reason, it's not the comfort that it usually should be. This is not the first time I've had my knitting mojo abandon me. I have been knitting for just over 10 years now. And I think in that time, there's been four, three or four instances, including this one, where my knitting mojo has just gone off to wherever. And uh, in the past though, they've always been in the days to like a week and a half variety. So they haven't been a very big deal. But this time it was a pretty big deal. And unfortunately with my knitting mojo my desire to spin went out the window and my desire to dye yarn went out the window like anything that had anything to do with yarn I didn't want anything to do with it so unfortunately I also did not have a shop update last month because I could not even stand looking at my dye pots I just didn't want anything to do with yarn uh, so there are lots of reasons it can leave you um, in my experience all of them are negative things and so what do you do to get it back? Um, in the past, I've um, just gone with it because again, it's only been a few days and then made myself knit something kind of small but instant gratification. And then usually I picked right back up where I had left off and I jumped right back into things. Um, this time I have been trying not to force it because it's not really a good idea to try to force things all the time either. Sometimes all you need is a jump start, but other times maybe not so much. Um, so I've been working on just that blanket. Like that blanket is all the knitting I do and at most on any given day I've been working on it 10 minutes, maybe 15. Just enough to get like an inch and a half, two inches on it and then just putting it down because um, I've been more interested in the cross stitch and actually right now is Spinzilla. I didn't even talk about Spinzilla. I haven't made much progress but I'm working on this. <laughs> I'll talk about that in the next episode when I have yarn to show you. Um, so anyway... <laughs> So I've been uh, just accepting it and I switched to a different craft, which to me that sounds reasonable. If one of your crafts is suddenly undesirable, it's not a bad idea to switch to a different one temporarily or to a different hobby that you enjoy. Like I actually got a lot of reading done in this time too, or for me a lot of reading, um, more than usual because I suddenly had more time to just do other things. So I did some reading, I've been doing a lot of cross stitch. Um, right now I'm spinning again, so I'm spinning and slowly cross stitching, uh, very slowly knitting. And uh, yeah, you just sometimes you have to give yourself permission to just not feel like doing something. I've had a couple of friends this year who have had large losses in their lives of a parent, of a parental unit, of a parent. Um, this has happened to two friends of mine, I think in the last six months. And in both cases, I think both of them took at least a month if not three or four months off of crafting because they just didn't feel like it and that's hard when um, crafting is a source of comfort for you actually right now the yarn harlot um stephanie pearl mcphee on her blog has been talking about this a bit um i don't usually follow stephanie's blog but another friend of mine pointed these entries out to me and she has recently lost her mother and she was discussing how her desire to knit it was just gone 
and she was discussing the loss of uh, knitting desire in terms of grief and especially losing somebody what seems to be the number one recommended thing that people talk about there so I'll let you go to her blog uh, which I think is the yarn harlot dot com or dot ca I don't remember what it is uh, but she, it's a Canadian site so it might be dot ca um, and she talks about that there but for me um, my mojo still hasn't come back I was expecting by the time I recorded that I would be back to knitting and I would be able to tell you guys what is helping me and the answer right now is nothing nothing has helped um so I'm going to continue doing what I've been doing which is to very slowly work on my blanket squares and I have picked out some patterns that I would like to work on I feel excited when I look at patterns and I feel excited when I look at my yarn but actually doing the knitting is difficult and I'm hoping to do some knitting actually tomorrow because with this show I'm doing on Saturday I picked up some bulky weight yarn which I don't normally dye up and I'm actually hoping to um knit a sample hat tomorrow which in bulky weight is totally doable it should be like a two hour project it's the new pattern by um hedgehog fibers they're always free patterns i think it's called the ready ready hat maybe she just announced it today on her instagram so um even if you go to her site or if you look up her patterns on ravelry it'll come right up it's it's made for bulky weight and she's going to do she did it in two contrast colors i have something cooling right now uh that i'm going to rinse and then skein up and i'm going to knit a very quick very quick and dirty bulky hat tomorrow um to just kind of give people an idea of how these things look so anyway i'm hoping that that might be finally what jump starts my mojo and gets me back into the desire to knit because i also bought and picked up a worsted air and weight sweater to work on something that's big and is beautiful and will be quick ish but still feels like an accomplishment i do also need some more dishcloths and things so those might be another good uh quick instant gratification project and maybe get me started again uh so anyway that kind of went to rambling at the end um i'm gonna let you guys go I'm going to try to record again. I had meant to record these at the end of the month rather than the beginning. Um, as a reminder, I am going to be ceasing the podcast as it currently exists at the end of this year. Probably I'll do a final podcast like towards the Christmas time. And then I think for the, I don't know, maybe I'll do an end of December, early January podcast so that I can at least tell you guys what I plan to do or I could start off fresh with a new podcast, but I don't think, I think I'm going to take a hiatus for two to four months, depending on how I feel and not record and not do anything and decide what I want to do for my new podcast. Um, I do have some ideas, but I need to do like new graphics and I need to get stuff set up and I'm going to be taking a hiatus with Lamy too at that time. I talked about this last episode too. At first I thought I was going to completely shut down and rename Lammy, but now I'm thinking I may just rework a lot of Lammy's graphics. I'm going to try to finally get Lammy's website up and running. Um, and I'm going to try to do some of that stuff, but I think I'm going to tie in um, Lammy's new stuff with the new podcast. I'm trying to kind of condense things down into a single name or something that's more, be more related and a little less uh, cobbled together. So I hope you all have been having a lovely September and October. Um, if you guys are like us, you're unnaturally warm and you're jumping between like 20 to 30 degree temperature spans. Like the, the weather's been just... Mm. <laughs> For those of you who are going to Rhinebeck, I hope you have an amazing time. Uh, I will be there with you guys in spirit if I do not make it there physically. Um, maybe if I pull in a renter in the next three days, I'll <laughs> change my mind and go. Um... But anyway, guys, I'm now umming a lot too, which means I don't really know what I want to say anymore. I'm going to let you go. Thank you so much for joining me today, and I will leave you as I always do. Until we talk again, please be your very best selves and do good things, kittens. Bye.